Okay. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Our next presentation, Making Build Systems Not Suck by Yossi Pakkanen. Please make him feel welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I am Jussi Pakkanen, and I'm here to talk about build systems. But I'm going to start off with a small disclaimer. So uh, for my day job, I work for Canonical, and I'm working on the Ubuntu phone. And I actually have one of them with me. So if anyone wants to ask me questions about that one, please come see me afterwards. But uh, this presentation is, is my own free time project. So anything that I say here, it does not necessarily ref reflect on any opinion of anyone else, including my employer. Now, um, I was watching the CPPCon presentations a few months ago, and there was a choice code in one of the presentations by a Boost developer, which I wish, wish to present, start this presentation with. And he said, let's talk about build tools. All build tools suck. Let's just be upfront, and that's it. Um, and if you talk to people, this seems to be a general consensus. There's some sort of um, Stockholm syndrome where everyone has known this for a while, that, that the existing systems are not really good. For some reason, nothing has happened. So let's look at some ways in which they actually suck. Um, and the main thing is, at least in my personal opinion, is that the current build systems don't support the flow. Now, the flow is a psychological phenomenon um, originally found by this guy, whose name I'm not going to even attempt to pronounce. But the point is that uh, when you're working on problems and, or, or as an athlete or something like that, um, uh, when you start working on something, it takes you about 30 minutes to get, actually get into the problem. Um, oh, is there a problem? Okay, cool. Uh, and, to get, and then at some point, the rest of the world disappears, and then you, it's just you and the problem, and you can actually totally focus on that. Now, this is very hard to achieve. It takes about 30 minutes uh, on average. It's very easy to lose. So if you work in an uh, office and your manager comes and taps you on the shoulder, there you go. You just lost your, your possible flow. Uh, for programmers, this looks like this. So there are uh, three phases of, of a programmer's life. That's where you edit stuff, when you debug stuff, and then when you build stuff. And um, two of these are productive. One of them is not. And if this takes longer than five seconds, then you lost your flow. Um, and another way of saying this is that a running compiler holds a mutex on your brain. And when the, yeah, the compiler is running, you can't just like... Cut. So, yeah. But uh, there are also some practical problems. Um, the basic design of, of any system is that simple things must be simple, and hard things must be possible. And if you can make the hard things easy as well, even better. So let's look at the simplest possible thing that you could actually do. And there's the Hello World C application. And if you compile it, I uh, want to compile it with auto tools, then you get to meet something like this. And if you do the calculation, this thing has more boxes and arrows than the Hello World application has characters. And if this is the, the way your system is, you might have a complexity problem. Um, let's look at something slightly more difficult. So you have a, an application which uses some sort of dependency, let's say GDK3. And if you look at the way people tend to write uh, CMake files, you usually find something like this. So you have the project definition, uh, minimum version for that, you, you want to use package config, you want to search the package config, and, and so on, and so on, and so on. So this is seven lines of code. It's fairly re readable. It's not that difficult. Um, except there's a bug in here. So um, this should have the word required in it, because if, since it doesn't, if, if the system package isn't found, it will just continue on. And then when you try to use it, you get interesting uh, error messages. OK, but it's OK, seven lines of code, one bug. It's not that bad, right? Well, there's a second bug, which is, which is actually over here. So when you uh, use these things, what you need to do is you add the include directories to, so that the compiler can find your headers. But a package config file might also provide extra compiler flags. And this doesn't add them. And most uh, packages don't use them. Some do. And if you are used to doing things like this, then you get interesting bugs to fix. So OK, seven lines of code, two bugs. That's not that bad. 
Well, there's a third bug in here. So uh, just like with the, uh, uh, the include directories, is, uh, this only adds the libraries, but the, there might be other linker flags as well, usually uh, link directories. So you need to use ggk3 underscore ld flags. Um, so, I don't know, doesn't seem very, very simple. Um, let's do something harder. So if you want to use uh, pre-compiled headers, and uh, so if you don't know, this is a method for accelerating C++ compilation, uh, sometimes by quite a wide margin. And GCC has supported this for, I don't know, 10, 15 years, and absolutely no one uses it because it's really hard to set up. And uh, there's a bug on the CMake bug tracker, which is in this address, uh, where the official stance is Sorry, but doing this right as a first-class feature is very non-trivial. Every Pratman does PCH differently, so it's hard to define a common interface. It's probably possible we had enough time, motivation and time and funding to do it. And well, in cases, this is totally fine, because you, when you write any sort of piece of software, you decide what your system does and what it doesn't do. And, but then it goes on to say that currently CMake does provide enough primitives for projects to do it themselves on each platform. Now, if you actually code this page, uh, you can find that people have uh, added multiple different modules as attachments to this box saying, hey, okay, here's my implementation of pre-compiled headers. There's about five of them. Uh, I've written one, and there are a few other ones as well. And they all have one thing in common, which is the fact that none of them actually work. So they, they kind of work when you don't do anything too tricky, but, but if you try to do anything fancier, then it fails in, again, interesting ways. Um, right. So, um, what kind of, so if, if, if we, let's imagine a, a world where we have a build system which doesn't suck. So, what would we like? What, what's, what sort of design features would it have? Well, let's start with something simple. So, when you run your build command, you either get an error or you get a fully built thing. And um, producing something silently that's actually wrong is not something that you should ever accept. And if you have some flags in your system or, or options in your system that allow you to build very unsafely and which are possibly even on by default, it's not a very good thing because um, you really don't want to be debugging problems where you have style, stale files. Um, then another thing is that uh, you should do the thing that's common by default and then allow people who don't want to do the common thing to do something else. So um, if you look at the way most, most uh, make files and so on are written, they all, mo all do almost exactly the same thing. And there's very, very small variations on like in, in the uh, edges of the, the case. So let's just do the thing where you, okay, let's do the common thing, make it very simple, and then you do something else. Then there's this one, which I feel is pretty self-explanatory. Um, and also, file names have sp can have spaces in them, and they sh that should just work. And um, you, as a developer, shouldn't have to do quoting, especially if you start quoting your quotes in order to get them through the multiple layers of things. Then you are inception land, and you're not very happy. Um, uh, this is also so... Um, best possible build system would be invisible. It would just be your brain and do stuff. Um, we're not there yet, technology-wise, um, but in the meantime, so what we can do is to minimize the time that you need to do to write your old build definitions. This would be very simple to do, because all that time that you spend writing build definitions could actually be spent on doing the actual code, which is much more fun. Um, uh, then there's this where you, the user really shouldn't need to tell things that the system already can find out from somewhere else, such as what is the flag to turn on uh, debug mode. For, because it's different in different compilers, and if you just use dash G, it will work almost all the time, except when it doesn't. And this is, these are things where, which you shouldn't, you shouldn't have to deal with compiler flags. You, if you want to, go, for, go nuts, but you shouldn't have to. Um, Global variables, we have come to the conclusion in the software industry that these are bad and global state is bad, but uh, 
Build systems are almost entirely of nothing but global variables and global state. Um, if you want to like uh, find out what sort of things uh, affect the build options of this thing which I'm going to build over here, you have to read through all of the code because it's totally impossible to find it out otherwise. Um, then it's the uh, build speed. Um, build speed is essential because it's, it's wasted time. And uh, dirty tricks to make it faster are totally cool, just as long as, as it's not exposed in any way uh, by the implementation. Um, having s uh, sane and sufficiently rich data types, that's always, always a plus. Among other things, having an array, which is very, very rare among build systems. Um, or having objects and all that sort of thing, which makes you know, everyday development life such, so much easier. This was something that came as a surprise to me uh, when I started working on this project. Um, one of the main problems when you do this sort of thing is that you, by accident, write a dependency loop where something depends on another. And it turned out that if you design your system properly, it's impossible to express a loop inside your dependency chain. And then all like, massive amounts of complexity just go away. Um, user interface um, has a rough outline of what it should be. Um, uh, every build system should come with this big red button. And the idea is that no matter what you do, to get a build, you just do this. It's the same operation every single time. You don't have to care. And the system takes care of all of that in the background. You don't have to, OK, so I edited the build definition files, and then, then the, which means that I have to, no, 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 no. Let's, let's not go there. Um, then um, the not invented here syndrome is bad. So let's steal everything that the other build system had, which is actually good. Uh, and there's quite a lot of that. So as an example, the auto tools two-phase build is a very, very good design. So first you do your configure step, and then you do your build step. And this nicely separates out the, the various bits that you need to do. Now, this is a good thing, so let's steal that one. Uh, CMake. Um, one of the best things about CMake is that uh, the build is defined in terms of a virtual um, computer. So you don't write, the back end is not exposed to you. You just write in this abstract thing, and then this can be retargeted to Visual Studio or Xcode or w whatever. And this is a really nice thing, so let's steal that one. Uh, there's scones. Uh, scones is um, basically it's a library for Python. And then you import that, and you write some Python code, and then you can get your build out of that one. And the, the reason people use Python instead of Perl is that it's actually aesthetically pleasing, and it's nice, and it's really good to use. So this is something that we should do also. Uh, then there's JIP. Uh, JIP is the build system for Chromium. And uh, basically, it's a bunch of JSON files. So you write out your JSON file, uh, which gives the, this, the state of the system, and then it just builds from there. And the main, main point of this is that it's not a Turing-complete language. You cannot program in it. But still, it's expressive enough that you can compile the entire of build tree of Chromium. And whenever you can do something that's not Turing-complete, you should do that because it makes everything so much easier. And uh, JIP is also about, all about scalability. So uh, the scalability of your system should start at 10,000 files and not end at there. Uh, then there's QMake and the, the Q build system, which is their new, new one. And they have native, native QT support. And it's, it's very popular. And it's a bit tricky to set up. So you should probably do that as well. So let's. Take all of these things together and, and try to make, make one build system that has all of them. Um, so what would it then look like? So let's start with the Hello World project. So it's two lines of code. First, you define a project, which has some sort of name, and then the languages that you want to use. And then you say an executable with the name of, of, of this thing, and then the source files that, that are in it. And this, that's, that's it. So it's two lines of code, which doesn't seem like much, but it actually gets you quite a lot. So you can build this with, with Linux, FreeBSD, and all sorts of things, OS X, Windows, Visual Studio, MinGW, and all those sorts of things. 
And compiler warnings are on by default, so wall and uh, wpedantic, because if you're not using compiler warnings, you're not doing software engineering, you're doing astrology. And uh, then you have different build times, which uh, what, what CMake does is that you can have debug builds, optimized builds, and all those sorts of things. And you just say, oh, now I want this type of build. Uh, Cross-compilation, um, it's, well, it's just using a different co compiler, really, so, so there's not that much difficulty. And the outputs you get from this are native binaries, executables, produced by the native toolchain that you can actually run directly under GDB or Valgrind and not with libtool dash ex or whatever the command thing was. Uh, so if you want to use a dependency, uh, start the same, then in the middle you say dependency gdk3-0, uh, and this then uses package config in the background, and then it returns you this kind of opaque object. And then when you have an executable which you want to use gdk3 in, you just say dependencies, and then the dep list of dependencies that you want, in this case gdk3. And you don't have to babysit any of the compiler flags or anything like that, you just just do it. Uh, in this unit tests, um, you just create an executable, and then you say a test called simple test, run this executable. And if the return value is zero, everything is fine. Um, there's the pre-compiled headers, which you remember from earlier. Um, which, what they said, it's really difficult to think of a way to have a common interface. Well, here's my suggestion for a common interface, where you say that the uh, CPP pre-compiled header file for this target is this one. Um, and as an example of, of the kind of performance gain that you can get, uh, I was working uh, with a Qt5 dbus tool, and it's uh, using this device, and it took me about two minutes to compile from scratch, and then I enabled the pre-compiled headers for the Qt, op Qt uh, headers, and it went from two minutes to less than one minute. And it took me less than one minute to write the file. So this is a very good use of your time. Um, right. So let's, let's look at a slightly more complicated example. So let's build a C++ shared library uh, that uses glib in the implementation, or, or the unit test for that, install it in the system proper directories, and let's create a package config file so other people can use it. So this is uh, multiple. So at the top level of the, the source tree, we have this first we start the project and we have uh, C++. Then we add a global argument for, uh, to use C++11 and this means that it's used in every single C++ compile that you have. Uh, and the thing is that you can set global arguments but you cannot unset them. So you, there's never the question of oh, wait, is it valid here or not. If it's, if it's in a global argument it's always used and you can't prevent that. So then we find the uh, glib dependency, um, and then uh, we have an include directory, and we need that in the search path for headers. So we do include directories include, and this again doesn't set anything in the global uh, header path, it just returns this opaque object, which we're going to use later. Right. And subdir means that go to this subdirectory and execute the meson file in there, and then come back. And then we do the include directory, we do the source directory, and we do the test directory. Now, inside the include directory, uh, there are some header files. We just want to install them. Uh, in the source directory, so we have our shared library, which uh, has the name foo, and it has these two source files. And the include directories to be used for this particular build are the, from the inc variable, which we ma made earlier. It uses this dependency, and we want to install it as part of our install dep, and it will install it in the uh, prefix lib directory, which is for the system default. And then there's a simple uh, hel hel helper uh, function for package config, um, and this libraries is just a list of libraries that you need to link against in order to use, use the thing. Uh, and then, then you specify a few pieces of metadata, and then you're done. And, and as part of uh, Ninja install, it will generate this file and put it inside the proper package config directory. Now, uh, let's, then we need to build a unit test. 
So we have a test with the name, a source file, and it has the same include directories. And then you uh, link it against the library that we built earlier. And then you define a test with a, with a specific name. And that's the build definitions in its entirety. And no, this is really the entire thing. You don't have to write anything else. And, and it, you can almost do it, well, do it once, and then you can just do it from memory. And, and you don't have to look up all the, all the manuals and stuff. Um, and while we are on this subject, so uh, let's build a Qt5 application. So we need to find the Qt5 dependency. Um, and it has multiple different modules, like widgets and dbus and, and declarative and all those sorts of things. No, we just want to use widgets. So we have an executable, uh, which, and these are the source files that it contains. And these are the headers that you need to pre-process with the mock preprocessor. These are the UR files that you need to pre-process with the UIC compiler. And this is the resource files that you need to do with the resource compiler. And this is the dependencies that you want to use when actually compiling the C and C++ files. And this is how you compile Qt5 applications. And uh, looking at the performance, so here's a, a ARM board, which I, I have, and it's a, about a gig of RAM. And it's running uh, Debian unstable. And um, this is uh, compiling the glib library. Now, I removed GIO um, just out of laziness because I didn't have time to, to convert GIO as well. But the point is that you compile with the uh, order tools build system that they have and then with Meson, which I, I, I did the port. So that, um, if you do the uh, first the configuration step and you disable the optimization so it's, it's the same and you run autogen and this takes about five minutes. And if you do the same with Meson, it takes about 24 seconds. Um, it doesn't do quite as much, but it sets up all, all the tests that you need in order to actually compile glib and, and the unit tests and all that sort of stuff. So it's about the same. Uh, then, when, then you do the actual build. So uh, it's a dual core machine, so you use two, two things, and it takes about five minutes to build. And if you do the same build with Meson, which uses Ninja, it's one minute and 28 seconds. Um, I actually don't know why this is so fast. It, it really shouldn't be. So other tests that I've run, it's about 10% faster or something like that. For some reason, this, this, if anyone has a good idea of why this is happening, please come talk to me, because it, this doesn't make any sort of sense to me. Um, it, it does build slightly less code, but like 10% less, maybe. Um, but this is the actually important one, because this is the one that you deal with every day. So how, do you, how much does it take to do an incremental build? Uh, if there are no changes at all, the overhead of uh, make and order tools is three seconds, and slightly less for Meson. And if you do, if you do a simulation of what it would like, if you change one file, so you just touch this uh, one file, and then you do a rebuild, it takes uh, one minute and 18 seconds. And um, anyone in the audience want to guess how long it takes for Meson? Sorry, how much? I, I couldn't hear it. 40 seconds? Anyone going lower? Uh, 0.2 is a bit too low, so it's 1.1 seconds. Now, the reason for this is that there's an optimization trick which is stolen from a LibreOffice, and they stole it from Chromium. So what actually is happening here is that the, uh, the auto tools also takes about one minute, uh, no, one second to compile the actual shared library. But then it relinks all the test applications. Now what, what Mesen does is, is that shared libraries are defined by the list of symbols that they export. So when you compile that, you export the list of symbols. And then when you compile it again or relink it again, you extract the list of symbols again. And if it hasn't changed, then you know that you don't have to relink because nothing has changed. And using these sorts of, these sorts of tricks, uh, the day-to-day -day development becomes really much nicer, because it's a very, very common, common case where you have one shared library, and then you have a bunch of tests for that. Uh, on the desktop, um, configuration time usually takes less than five seconds, uh, depending on how many tests you have. Um, and no build times is less than one second. I've never seen more than one but that's mostly because it's using Ninja, which is made of awesome. 
and uh, this is only one process, so it doesn't do the recursive make kind of thing. So it has the entire dependency graph in memory at the same time, and then it can just saturate the CPUs at all time. Um, okay, so let's look at some advanced features now. Uh, one thing which you usually want to do is that you build a program and then you use that to generate more source code and then build that. So how would you do that? Well, first you uh, generate your compiler and then you create this thing which is called a generator and, and takes the binary and it, then it tells, okay, it produces these two files for each input file. Uh, and, and these are the command line arguments that you pass into the uh, compiler. And then you just tell it to, to process these files. And then it again returns this opaque object, and which contains the header files and source files that are generated. And then you build an executable, and you put that in the list of source files to use, and then you're done. Now, um, the problem here is that what if you are cross-compiling? Because if you cross-compile, then you can't do that because um, you can't run the executable on the native on the build system. Oh, sorry, build host. Um, so what would it take to actually do a cross-compilation? Well, there are two options for this. One is that you don't have to do anything at all because um, there are cases where you can actually run your cross-compiled binaries natively. As an example, if you're using Wine. So if you're compiling for with MintyW, on, under Linux, uh, you can tell Messen to use Wine as an ex executable wrapper so that it can run all of these binaries. And then uh, it will use it automatically there, and you don't have to do anything at all. Even better, it will also do this for your unit tests. So if you are forced to develop with, with Linux and Windows, you can do them both from the Linux from the command line in one step or two. So you have to build either one, which is kind of nice. Uh, this, uh, the other option is that you do this and you tell it that this native uh, is true, which means that it uses the build uh, the local co compiler and not the cross compiler to build this particular one. And then it will always just build that using the system compiler and it will work. Now you can't actually install this one in the cross compiler because it's wrong, but you can use it to build your own. Um, so another thing which is uh, is that usually Projects need different kinds of options. So you can define these options, and they are actually strongly typed. So you, have an op you can have a string option, or a Boolean option, or an enum in this case, where you have, have multiple choices, and you, can, and, and you can only select one of those. And then from the command line, you can query what the, what the values of these are. You can set them. And then inside your, your message configuration files, you can say, oh, get me the value of this thing of this option, and then you just get that directly. Uh, the list of languages that are currently supported, so uh, these go in the order of how much do I actually need to use them myself. So C and C++ are the, the most best supported, and there's Objective-C on C++. Uh, Fortran, there was a guy, guy in uh, Spain who sent me patches for about 10 different Fortran compilers. And then there's the, the other ones, which kind of work, um, haven't been all that much battle tested yet. Um, so there's, uh, there's this is a very, very test driven thing. So there are over 100 unit tests, and each of these is also a sample project. So how would, how would you use Mesin to do a project that does a static library, a shared library, and, and so on and so on. And all features must come with a unit test, and so then we can actually tell that you don't break things by refactoring. And there is one controversial feature. So if you're a really old school Unix guy, um, be careful, because the system will not allow you to do in-source builds. You always have to have a, a separate build directory, and you put stuff in there. And this is not out of, out of personal hatred to people who build in-source, but uh, it turns out that you can actually do either a system that provides in-source build or an out-of-source build. Um, if you try to do both, it will break in interesting ways, which I don't have time to get into. Um, but this is one of those things where if you are used to building in source, and then you actually try building out of source, it's kind of like when you find revision control for the first time, it's like, yeah, I don't need that. And then you try it once, and it's like, what have I been doing? It's like, 
join the dark side. It's, it's actually pretty good. And there are benefits to this. Because as an example, if you want to run the Clang static analyzer, uh, the steps to do it are always the same. You create a temporary throwaway directory, and then you do your steps in there. And it's guaranteed not to clobber any other build currently ongoing. Even better, you can create your own target, and then you type ninja static analyze, and it will run the static analysis for you, and it's guaranteed not to clash with anything else. And if you have a system that does allow in-source builds, this is something that you cannot do, because you might have stuff in your, your source tree that's from somewhere else, and you have to delete that, and then you have to do your build, and you have to restore your state, and it, it gets really, really complicated. Um, a, a bit of a uh, side tour. So there are quite a lot of build tools, and there are also quite a lot of IDEs, and these work together very poorly because you have to write your exporter to every single one of these. Um, and some of them are really, really funky with their, the way they do things. Now looking at this, there's an, the, also the obvious, obvious solution is that you have some sort of common format in a way which uh, build tools can expose their system to the IDE. And the IDE can load that and things become simpler. Now the problem is that this doesn't exist, or at least it didn't. So I had uh, talked with one of the guys doing Qt Creator and he helped me uh, create this one. So this is a very simple JSON file format, uh, which you can use for IDE integration. So uh, you can basically introspect everything. You're like project source files, unit tests, with, uh, uh, and all the environment variables that you need to set in order to run your test, the command line arguments that you need to set in order to run your test. And uh, we, with this, we can finally reach the thing that Java developers had in 1996, or thereabouts is that you can actually click on an IDE, say, run your test, and then if something fails, you can right-click on it and say, start this in the debugger, and it will set up everything for you. Now, I don't know of a single IDE that still would, that does this, but from the message side, it's already there. I really, it, please, if, if you're an IDE developer, please do this, because I want this. Um, so then, well, what can you build with it? Uh, so the way this, the, the Meson is developed is that um, I put in stuff that I think is interesting and, and useful, and then I grab some projects that are large and try to compile them, and then add all the features that are necessary in order to make them build. And uh, Jill, you already saw, uh, Qt Creator is, a, is several thousand files, so its scalability seems to be pretty good. Uh, MAME is huge, uh, and they build with just plain make, and it's, it's quite well done, so it's interesting. Um, Mesa 3D, they have an interesting thing where they have XML definition of their, of their, of the OpenGL system, and then they generate code from that. That's quite interesting. Now, the uh, last thing, there's the eternal battle, which we heard in the previous talk, is that there are people who really want to do stuff with distro packages, and there are people who really want to embed everything themselves. And then usually they start arguing about this and talk past each other, and it's, it's not very productive. So is there a technical solution for this? So uh, in the Meson, what you can do is that you have any sort of project that's run in Meson, and you can use it as a sub-project. So then it becomes a sandboxed part of the build that you already have. Uh, this, if, if you're familiar with Go, Go has the Go Get, which downloads stuff and puts it, and then you can use it. It's pretty much the same. So how you would use it, so first you try to find the dependency with, uh, with these normal things. And if it's not found, then you just use the subproject command, then it builds it as part of your build, and then you can just use that one. So here's what it looks like in practice. Uh, this is a simple SDL2 application running in three platforms at the same time. Uh, on, starting from the left, uh, left, there's the Ubuntu 64-bit, uh, and it's using the system packages. Then there's uh, Windows XP using Visual Studio and a zip file of the SDL library that I just downloaded from, from the SDL homepage. And then there's finally uh, OS X using a framework version of the same libraries that you can also download from. Uh, and you can see the, the build definitions behind each one of the things. Uh, the, the far end ones are actually exactly the same. And if you would join the, all of these together, there would be something on the order of 10 lines of code. Um, so closing, uh, it's Apache licensed, and, and 
So there's a reference implementation which is in Python 3. Uh, so there's a, the definition of the system doesn't expose Python in any way. So if you want to re-implement it in C++ or shell scripts or whatever, it's totally possible. It's available in Ubuntu 14.10 and uh, Debian Jesse, which should be released at some point, hopefully. Uh, and the GitHub has all the, all the there's actually actual man documentation. So, so th there was a documentation mini conf earlier, and, and 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 documentation is important. That's why I have it written. Uh, any contributors are welcome, and if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Yep. So, questions. Um, build systems are often divided into categories of those that use timestamps as the fundamental you know, test for whether something is, needs to be rebuilt and those that check some of the source code. Um, I wasn't sure if you actually mentioned which one it uses in Mison. So that depends on the back end that you use. Um, the, currently, it's, there's only Ninja, and Ninja uses timestamps. Right. Is it possible to use a back end which is based on checksums? Um, if, you, if someone writes it, sure. Right. Okay. Um, so the uh, timestamp thing is something that if you are using something like NFS, then your timestamps can vary wildly. But if you build a local file system or local drive, that, uh, I haven't had problems with that, but maybe you have. Follow up the second question. Is there, um, second question is um, speed of build on Windows. Um, I often find that build systems can perform extremely well on Linux and other Unix hosts, but the same build system on Windows might perform extremely badly. And for those trying to build software for both platforms, uh, the sort of tests like uh, you know that you've described, how is the performance on Windows? Okay, so the the performance of the actual build depends on the backend again, because I just generate the backend thing. And uh, Ninja was, was created by guys who work on Chrome. So they use it to build Chrome on Windows as well. And they have done everything possible to make it as fast as possible. And um, unless I'm mistaken, it's the fastest possible way currently known that you can build stuff on Windows. Uh, there were, yeah. Um, you mentioned that like, you've got a set of languages you already support. I was wondering how difficult it is to say you're also generating some documentation in your project or you want to use it for two languages to so say like with Node.js you'd have JavaScript which you might want to package up in some way but you also might have some native uh, C bindings to some library that you're building at the same time in one module. Is it possible to have like adding in an additional language to the main language of a project? So you can have as many languages as you want. Okay, so project isn't just one that can yeah. be So if, if you want to compile, let's say, a Java with JNA, then you just have the Java files and you have your shared library and you put them together and that's it. So possibly related question there, just uh, is there a mechanism to basically add custom build commands for, again, generating documentation, delegating to other build systems, that kind of thing? Right. So, um, yes. So you can ha have your own build targets, uh, which um, either just run some command, like, like, like let's say one, one Clang format. Then you, you just run a command just like the static analysis. And you can also specify your own targets, saying that this will produce this thing, and you run it, this command to create it. Um, can you uh, run build stages in parallel? Um, um, how do you mean? Like, if you had a sort of a workflow where you do compile and then you do, uh, and then you have a testing stage, and the testing stage has several tests, many of which can can be run in parallel safely. Oh, okay, so um, the unit testing system of Meson runs tests by in parallel automatically, and you don't have to do anything. And if there are tests which cannot be run in parallel, then you have to specify parallel false. We still have time for more questions. Um, can your build configuration be spread across multiple files, or do you have to specify everything in one file? 
um, so you can separate out into multiple files. So, so if you, the subdir command is like you go this, that and you then execute the, the file in there. So currently you can only have one definition file per directory, and it always has to have the same name. Um, this might change depending on, on how the or, uh, development of the language goes. But so far it's been sufficient to have only one. So how long have you been working on this? And do you know, do you have any feeling how many users you have or are there any very big projects that you can give us a reference? So I started this two years ago. Um, and as, so I, I, I know some people are using it. Now, here's a piece of advice for everyone. If you ever create something new, um, create a file name that is unique um, without the period without the suffix, because the, the definition file is mesen.build, and you cannot search for this word in Google or GitHub because it will helpfully split the word at the period, and you can't search for the exact phrase. So it's hard to find these files. Um, um, I get bug reports fairly consistently and, 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 and submissions of new features, so people are using it. Um, hopefully more after this contrast. Uh, is the port uh, to build Jalip with uh, Meson available somewhere? Um, so can you say again? You, you make uh, uh, you change Jalip uh, to build uh, with Meson. Is available everywhere, uh, anywhere? Um. <laughs> <laughs> the port you made to uh, build. Oh, oh so so oh, uh, you mean this Jalip? So, yeah. Um, Whenever I do one of these, I send an email to the mailing list of the project involved saying that, hey, I'm, I did this thing. If you are interested, feel free to look into it. And if you look at the, use Google to search. And uh, on the wiki page, there's actually a link for the mailing lists of each one of these. Um, we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, sorry, follow-up question. Um, just the neat trick that you, t you mentioned about looking at the symbols in C libraries, shared C libraries. I don't suppose your Java module does anything similar? No. But Java compiles so fast that usually you don't care. <laughs> so I had in mind um, AOSP, which is humongous, so like it really helps yeah. when you... My, my condolences. <laughs> But the thing is that um, because we, we, I don't expose any sort of implementation detail, if someone has an idea how you can do this with Java and make it faster, I'm all for it. I send patches. So, any further questions? There's still time. Oh, there's one. You listed off a, a number of the places where it would work. Other than sort of the big three, how portable would you say it is to sort of other places like FreeBSD, Solaris, and more exotic places? So um, what it currently requires is Python 3, and then you require um, Ninja. These are all very portable. Um, the biggest thing is that you need a... So FreeBSD already works. And when I ported it from Linux to FreeBSD, I had to add a few uh, search directories to, for shared libraries. It took me a few hours. Um, the bigger problem is that if you want to use the Solaris compiler, then you need to write a compiler definition file, um, which is not that much work. But, but if it does something crazy, then you might need to change the code. But uh, uh, thus far, adding new compilers has been fairly straightforward. So we'll have time for one more question, if there's a question. Um, have you done any work around building with uh, 
on, on systems where there are system libraries available, um, basically builds where you tell it ignore the system library and build with this separate copy of it that you have in a user directory or whatever? Um, I have done some. Um, do you have some sort of problem case in mind? I'm specifically thinking in the case of kind of the Python scientific ecosystem of building things like Conda virtual environments and that kind of stuff uh, where not using the system binaries can actually be an interesting challenge. Um, I haven't actually looked into that, but if, if you tell, I, I remember you have to have sort of compiler flags to tell, tell the compiler not to search somewhere. And uh, you can add arbitrary command line flags. So it's very simple. If, if, if you can do it with this, then it should be doable. If it needs some more magic, then I would be interested in hearing out because it's something that I would really want to support. Okay, so that's time. But just to thank you for your presentation today, you see we have a small gift. Right. And thank you very much. Right. Thank you very much.